Hello, church family. Welcome to Hump Day. I'm Deacon T.A. Spaulding. This is Men's Month, and this series is When Men Pray. Today's lesson is I Found the Answer, I Learned to Pray. So let us pray. Hello, church family. I am Deacon Jeffrey Smith, and I am honored to be asked to share a prayer with you during Men's Month 2020. The focus of our prayer together, brothers and sisters, will be that God be glorified during these trying times. Before we begin our prayer together, I would like to share two short passages of scripture with you to set the tone for our prayer. The first passage of scripture will be Romans chapter 8 and verse 39, where Paul writes that there is nothing in all creation that can separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Jesus Christ. The second passage of scripture is Psalms 24 verse 1 that says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and they that dwell in it. We know brothers and sisters that there are politicians and leaders and people in high places that are trying to tell us about changes that are going to come and they're predicting things that don't follow through. And if we're not careful, we're going to follow the wrong leadership. So as we pray together, we pray that God be glorified and that his people come together reading his scripture and reading his words and following our pastor's points to ponder that help keep us focused during these trying times. Let's pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let thy kingdom come and let thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord God, we come right now acknowledging that there is nothing in all creation that can separate us from your love. Not politicians, not leaders, not soothsayers and doom wishers that would have us to be disrupted and and constructed and destructed, Lord, during these trying times. We pray, O oh God, that you would be glorified during these trying times. Have thine own way, Lord. For in Psalm 24 and 1, the earth is yours, Lord, and all of us that dwell there in it. There is no way that the creation can be greater than the creator. So be glorified, we pray, O oh God, during these times. Heavenly Father, we stretch our hands to thee that there is no other help that we know, that all of our help comes from you, Lord. Heavenly Father, for every mountain that has been tried to been put in our way, Lord, you've moved it out of the way. For every valley, Lord, that they try to take us through, Lord, you lift us up on every leaning side. And for that, we say thank you. Be glorified during these trying times, Lord, that we hear so much information that can confuse us and get us all turned around. But Lord, you've blessed us each and every day. You wake us up in the morning and let us see your sunshine that lets us know that you're still on the throne. You put us to bed at night, Lord, and let us see your nighttime that lets us know that you're still on the throne. So, Heavenly Father, rain has come and rain has gone. That lets us know that you're still on the throne. So be glorified, Heavenly Father. Those of us that have spiritual eyes, we can see, God, that earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. Lord God, we pray for those who have lost loved ones during this time, Lord. We pray, God, that you would comfort them and lift them up on every leaning side. Be a fence all around them, Lord, and lift them up. Heavenly Father, we pray for a vaccine that would come, Lord, and, and be a good vaccine to heal everybody. And for those of us who are sick, Lord, with, with COVID-19, Lord, we pray, God, that you would bless them and heal them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Those of us, Lord, who are healthy, Lord, who have not had the problem with the virus, Lord. We pray that you would continue to be a fence all around us, Heavenly Father. Lord, we pray now that you would be glorified in these trying times, Lord, because we can see that you brought us over every mountain, every valley, every obstacle that you have moved out of the way that we might continue to be blessed. Heavenly Father, we haven't missed a meal. Thank you, God. We've been able to pay our bills. Thank you, God. We still have a reasonable portion of health and strength. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for being God all by yourself. All by yourself. So we say thank you, Lord, through 2020, Lord, that you'll continue to bless us and keep us. 
We pray, God, that you will continue to bless St. Stephen Church. Bless all of our members. Bless all of our senior members. Bless our pastor. Bless his wife, his family, and all of those in administration, Lord, that continue to share the word of God with us to help keep us focused during these trying times. So, God, we pray that you be glorified during these times, Lord, and we, your people, will lift up our eyes unto the hills, which cometh our help. All of our help has come from you. We pray, oh God, that you would bless us during this month of September, Lord, and going forward into the future. Thank you, God, for being so good, kind, and merciful to us, being so faithful to us. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you, church. It has been an honor to share and pray with you. May the Lord's blessings be with you. Continue to be faithful, continue to love our church, and do what we can to help one another, that God would be glorified during these trying times. God bless you. Today's lesson finds the Babylonian coming toward Jerusalem from the east. They had already defeated the Assyrians, so the people of Jerusalem knew they didn't stand much of a chance against such a superior military power. The leaders of Jerusalem believed they should align themselves with the Egyptians, but the Egyptians didn't want any part of the Babylonians. But Jeremiah told them, God says, you are going into captivity. What you really ought to do is to believe in God and go out and surrender to the Babylonians. After Solomon's death, Israel was divided into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom kept the name Israel and they consisted of ten tribes. The southern kingdom, Judah, consisted of two tribes which was Judah and Benjamin and of course like I mentioned before they went by the name Judah. Also by this time the northern kingdom had already been attacked, defeated, and captured by the Assyrians. The out, outraged leaders, thinking Jeremiah was a traitor, they threw him into prison and they refused to listen to his warnings. But Jeremiah wasn't too surprised at what the leaders did to him because they figured he was a traitor. But what else would God say to him now? He had obeyed the Lord and was in prison because of it. So what could be next? Jeremiah was in a real prison. We may be in a figurative prison constructed out of circumstances or predicaments, but the bars are just as real and the walls are just as high. Jeremiah 33, one, and three, one through three says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of prison, saying, Thus says the Lord who made it, the Lord who informed, the Lord who had formed it and established it. Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. So a point to ponder is, why do you think God reaffirmed his identity to Jeremiah? Well, I think that sometimes when you're in a fix, you need to hear it a second time. Thus said the Lord. God said to Jeremiah, there are three things that we need to remember. Three prayer principles. Prayer principle number one, we are, and God encourages us to pray. God says, call to me. We, never, we may never be put behind bars, but God will put us in situations in order, us, in order to teach us how to talk to him. Some of those situations may be problems on your job, problems in your marriage, sickness of yourself or a sickness of a loved one, and also children being incarcerated. There are many things God can use to draw you closer to him. 
First Chronicles 16 and 11 says, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Ephesians 6 and 18 says, do all this in prayer, asking for God's help. Pray on every occasion as the spirit leads. For this reason, keep alert and never give up. Pray always for God's people. Luke 18 and 1 says, Then he spoke a parable to them, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. I like to add 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17, which says, Pray without ceasing or never stop praying. Prayer principle number two, answer promised. God says, I will answer you. God promises he will not only hear our prayers, but he will answer them. Psalms 91 and 15 says, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Isaiah 58, 9 says, then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here am I. And that's good news. Isaiah 65 and 24 says, it shall come to pass that be before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. That lets you know God is already right there. He knows what you're going to say even before you say it. Another point to ponder is, think about requests that you have made to God recently. Are they being answered? Do you really believe they will be? Because if you don't, why pray? Another point to ponder is, you see, the question is not, does God answer prayer? The real question is, how does God answer prayer? Prayer principle number three is that God answers. When God answers our prayers, he e either answers with number one, yes, two, no, or number three, wait. Consider the following examples when God says yes. Luke 11, 5 through 13 says, Then, teaching them more about prayer, he used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight, wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. You say to him, A friend of mine has just arrived for a visit, and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out of his bedroom, don't bother me. The door is locked for the night and my family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for the friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. And so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive it. What you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. There are three things to consider in this story. First, the man had an unexpected problem. As long as we keep living, if you haven't already had one, you will. We, we will all have unexpected problems. They don't announce themselves and tell you when they're coming. An example of that is a heart attack. 
A heart attack don't come and say, hey, man, uh, be ready next Friday. I'm coming to see you. They come unexpectedly. And second, the man knew he had someone he could turn to who had what he needed. And thirdly, the man went himself. If you want something bad enough, you'll go get it yourself. You won't send your mama. You won't send your daddy. You won't send your wife or your kids. You'll go yourself. Hebrews 4 and 16 says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The man made a specific request. He needed three loaves of bread. So when you go to God, be specific. When there was no response, the man kept knocking. Be persistent. Don't stop after you hear no once or twice. If you need it bad enough, you'll keep on asking. It, is this where, this is where there is a contrast between God and man. The provider was reluctant because he was asleep. But God is never reluctant or asleep. Psalm 121 and 4 says, Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. So put your name where it says Israel. He that keepeth T.A. Spalding shall neither slumber nor sleep. The man answers the door because of importunity. Ask equals petition. Seek equals petition plus effort. And knock equals petition plus effort plus persistence. Many times we need prevailing prayer or we will have a failing prayer. I'm going to say it one more time. Many times we need prevailing prayer or we will have a failing prayer. Remember, there is a promise in a prevailing prayer. Example two, when God says no. Second Corinthians 12, seven through nine, Paul says, because of these surpassing great revelations, therefore in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect, perfect in weakness. Paul doesn't say exactly what his thorn is, but some think it was his vision. This kept him humble and dependent on God. So that takes me to my next point. Here are six principles to live by when God says no. And if you're studying and you've got your pen and paper with you, I need you to write them down and we'll go back over them later. Number one is treat trials as gifts. Number two, remember what God said. Number three, continue praying. Number four, listen to God's voice. Number five, trust in God's power. And number six, serve God where you are. So point number one, it says treat your trials as a gift from God. Because Paul says he was given a thorn. You can treat them as a nuisance to be ignored or just go away or a problem solve themselves. That a noise in the car or a numbness in your left arm or a bill that you received and immediately throw into file 13. You don't pray about them because you refuse to even acknowledge their existence. 
punishment to be endured. Well, I deserve everything that I'm getting. Just better grin and bear it. I'll be gone before too long, or it'll be gone before too long, or a problem to be solved, battle to be waged, and are you going to fight against God? Or you can treat them as a gift to be accepted. Acceptance is the issue. The point of prayer is to get God's will accomplished on earth and not man's will accomplished in heaven. Gifts bring joy. Gifts come from people who love you. And gifts also, at least the best ones, come from people that you know. Principle number two, remember that God has already said, surpassing great revelations. When God doesn't seem to be saying anything, rest your confidence on what God has already said. Think about some of the surpassing great revelations that God has given to you. Think about the goodness of what God has already done in your life. Prayer principle number three, continue praying to God. Because Paul said, three times I pleaded. Paul's prayer was, number one, persistent, and it was also passionate. Another example of a passionate prayer is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, where it says his sweat was like drops of blood. Also, Paul pleaded with God. That word, is translated, that is translated pleaded, is the same word that is used to describe the way Jairus asked for the healing of his daughter who was dying. Mark 5, 23 says, he pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. It was how a leopard sought cleansing from his leprosy. Mark 14, 1 and 40 says, a man with leprosy came to him and begged on his knees. If you are willing, you can make me clean. And it was how a servant begged his master for mercy over a bill that he owed so he wouldn't be thrown into prison and separated from his family. Matthew 18 and 29 says, his fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. So consider this, I ponder this point. How would you pray if your daughter was dying? How would you pray if your body was being destroyed with cancer? How would you pray if you were getting ready to be separated from your family that you loved because of COVID-19. The first response that many people give when God doesn't come through for them is that they give up on God or they give up on prayer. And that's before they ever get to the pleading level. They may have hinted, suggested, or even asked, but they haven't pleaded. It may very well be that God is just waiting until you are flat on your face before him, laying it all on the line, humiliating yourself in his eyes before he'll give you the answer to your prayer. God resists the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. Luke 18 and 1 says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Prayer principle number four, listen for God's voice because God says my grace is sufficient. We allow so many things to compete for our attention in our lives. We are so busy. There's no time and no motivation 
to just sit down and listen. Sometimes the only time that we are willing to listen to what God has to say. Principle number five is trust in God's power. Power, his power is made perfect. Trust in God's power and not your own. Trust in God's power when you have none. When God chooses not to use his power to alleviate the pain, trust in God's power to see you through the pain. Prayer principle number six, serve God right where you are. God says, I delight in weaknesses. And right now, I'm weak, but I'm trying to serve him right now. God will give me power and give me strength, and God will give you strength. Another point to ponder is, you want God to change your situation. But did you ever think that God put you in that situation to use you right in the middle of it? Don't ask God to change things until you've looked for and found how you can minister in or change, be changed by the circumstance that you face. God doesn't do anything without a reason. So example number three is when God says, wait. John 11, one through six says, now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Martha whose brother Lazarus now lay sick was the same one who poured perfume on Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. So he already told him that that wasn't going to be the end, that he wasn't going to die. He wasn't going to stay dead. But no, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Mary where he loved Martha. He loved a sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. And that just lets you know that it's never too late for God. He's always on time when he shows up. So when Mary heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So in all situations, we need to tell Jesus, we need to trust Jesus, and we need to turn it over to Jesus. So number one, when you tell Jesus, you tell him your distress, you tell him our difficulties, and you also tell him our disappointments. Matthew 14 and 12 says, then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. Matthew 15, 22 says, and behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him. Saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon possessed. John 11, 20 and 21 Says, now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. <clears throat> so points to ponder. When trials come, who do you run and tell? Do you run and tell Pookie, Bebe, Nuck Nuck? Mama, daddy, sister, brother, but you should run and tell Jesus because there's nothing too hard for Jesus. He's omnipotent. He has all power and he can do all things well. Another point to ponder is, do you remember a time when you were disappointed in Jesus? 
How did you handle this disappointment? I must admit, sometimes I, I used to get frustrated, but as I get a little older and wiser, I normally end my conversation with Jesus saying, not my will, let your will be done. Point number two is in all situations, we need to trust Jesus. He doesn't come when you want him, but he's never too late. John 11, 5 through 7 says, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. But oddly, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. He didn't hurry up and rush back. But after two days, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. So trust Jesus. When your blessings are delayed, it's not because your blessings are denied. In other words, blessings delayed is not blessings denied. So sometimes if God would have given us what we wanted, we probably would have destroyed ourselves. An example of that is when I was 16 years old, I wanted a Corvette. I was barely learning how to drive. If I would have got that Corvette, I would have probably killed myself. But at the age I am now, if I wanted that Corvette, I believe I can handle that blessing better at 50 plus than at age 16. John 11, 33 and 34 says, therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. So trust Jesus when you don't understand. John 11, 12 through 15 says, then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. That you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Point number three is turn to Jesus or turn it over to Jesus. There's a song that says, take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. So on John 11, 39 through 41, Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time, there is a stench. For he had been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was laying. A point to ponder is, what brings more glory to God? Healing a sick man or raising a dead man? He does does all things well. Point to ponder, again, is what would bring God more glory? I would say if you raise a dead man, that's a miracle. But if you heal a sick man, a lot of times they say, well, he would have got well anyway. So in conclusion, we don't like to wait around, especially when it looks like a unique opportunity may slip away. We don't like to hear God say no, especially when everything in us says, yes, yes, yes. We often try to find a scripture verse and claim it while we continue our prayer, hoping somehow to change God's mind. What we're, what we're really saying is, God, 
I don't like your answer. So how about reconsidering my point of view? But deep in our hearts, we really want God's perfect will in our lives. We really want to please God. But we must remember that God's answer is always his ultimate best for us. Claiming scripture would not change God's will because his word cannot contradict his will. I'm going to say that one more time. His word cannot contradict his will. If he says no, then the answer is no. If he says wait, then we should wait. God is more interested in our character, our future, and our sanctification than he is in our momentary satisfaction. His answers are always an act of grace and motivated, motivated by his love. Prayer principle, be thankful that during prayer we have the ability to tell Jesus about our situation and circumstances even when we don't fully trust him enough to t turn things over to him. Social justice principle, when you know someone waiting on an answer from God, don't try to explain God. Just share how you are able, or you were able, to trust while you were waiting. Evangelism principle, share, the, share with others the nevertheless spirit that Christ adopted so that we would not have to die a hopeless and painful death. Stewardship principle, when we give, we are helping others to get to know Christ. Disciple principleship, disciple principle. Even though we may not have received the answer you desired when you prayed, remember that God always answers with his love for us in mind. And that concludes today's lesson. Next week's lesson will be brought to you by David Birch entitled Prayer Changes Things.